while those people are still around, imbibe as much of their history as possible, understand what lies behind the heraldry, have a think about how the society or family association might develop in the future, how much should I as chief, future chief, be involved, how much can I leave to the office bearers. Some of these things may sound very humdrum, but part of the job of the standing council is to help the heirs understand that there are responsibilities ahead. It's not just a fancy title. There are real human responsibilities, and thousands of people around the world are looking to them precisely because they have pride in the name, whether it's a clan name or a family name. That human impulse is there. Woe betide the chief that disappoints, and we're trying to persuade the heirs to start thinking about it now. So that's just a snapshot of some of the things that the standing council is doing not taking anything away from the individual chiefs and their kindred because that's very much where the, the real vital spark is but where we can add value we try to thank you first of all i, I just wanted to tell you a little bit what it's like being being on the standing council because um i am not a chief and so what on earth am i doing there um, you know the expression too many chiefs not enough indians i'm the indian i'm, to I'm a token indian not Native American, but I've been, uh, but I'm an, uh, the non-chief. I'm a, what they call a two-feather chieftain, and, and, and people like me suffer from feather envy. You know, the, the, the uh, full chiefs, chief of the name, have three feathers, and that's the, um, that's the emblem of the standing council, which we hope we will be able to see in more places as more um, reliable, good vendors who are trying to get things right are, are uh, uh, going to be rewarded by being given that seal of approval in some form or other down the road. Um, uh, Andrew, if I'm the Lone Ranger, then at least I think Tonto had a couple of feathers. Which I think <laughs> is all right. There you go. Well, you see two, two feathers. It's, it's, more, it's more than nothing. And Andrew is the, uh, is the uncle of the current chief of the Morrison, so the, he's, he's not completely removed from this world. The, um, the reason that I was asked to go on the Standing Council some 10 years ago was really only because of partly because I was living in this country. And uh, something that Donald alluded to uh, is this in the importance of being a chief. It's more than uh, just a title, like my title is a title. I mean, I can't be, I'm a, I'm a Viscount, but I'm not a Viscount of anything. But if you're a chief, you're a chief of a clan or a chief of a family. And there is a very strong awareness amongst most of the chiefs that I've come in contact with of this mutuality of the fact that um, they don't have an existence without the family, the clan uh, that they are the chief of. And it's a historical fact now that although the chiefs are, for the most part, living in Scotland, the clans are over here or they're in New Zealand, or they're in Australia, or, or Canada, or, or wherever else they might be, but really principally in the United States. And so um, it's extremely important for the Standing Council to be able to keep good links with Scottish Americans. And that's why you know Tartan Day is a perfect day to celebrate those sorts of connections, because um, the chiefs themselves feel that strong bond and then the flip side of that is uh, we were hearing from uh, the presentation from Professor Sim, should we call you, uh, about the, uh, about the um, heritage tourism and how important that is and how it reaches into parts of Scotland that might otherwise be ignored. Well, a lot of that is, uh, is done in conjunction with this awareness of clanship or, or family connections uh, which makes people want to go back to a particular area. And again, the, uh, the chiefs are very conscious of their role as the focal point in some ways of that, uh, that sense of identity. We've, we've said, and Costco has said for many years, that people do not, um, do not just identify with Scotland straight from being, I'm a member of the diaspora and they're Scotland. They tend to do it through the medium of their surname connections in many cases, through their awareness of being, I'm not just a Scot, but like Donald over there, you might be a MacLeod. Um, you can't help it, he was probably born that way. But, you know, the, the, uh, but th there are the, 
these, this is a huge part of where, what people, what causes people to want to go back to Scotland is an awareness of where their family came from, where their clan came from. I wanted to just uh, pick up on a couple of other things that were mentioned earlier um, uh, when we were talking about the importance of independence and an awareness of this. Uh, and Jefferson was mentioned. And uh, one of the things that people don't necessarily know or talk about when it comes to Jefferson was not just that he had a, a tutor who was a Scot, but um, he was a huge fan of the, uh, the poetry that was published under the name of Ocean, but was really compiled by James McPherson, who was a, 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 a Scot at the time. And the um, McPherson's work, known as, a, as Ocean or Fingal, which was the, the, the title for much of it, was the single most important factor in the creation of the Romantic movement. So we heard a negative comment about Romanticism just now. But the Romantic movement was hugely important culturally in the late 18th and the 19th centuries. And the independence movements that sprung up not just in the United States, but in I mean, Germany came into existence, Italy came into existence for the first time, Greece found its, its, its freedom. All of these countries were a, a byproduct of the Romantic movement. Without Macpherson, they would not have happened. Um, and the Macpherson and, to a se secondary extent, uh, Walter Scott, who created the um, historical novel. So the, Jefferson was such a fan that he corresponded with Macpherson, and he said, Ocean is the greatest poet who ever lived. And he said he's greater than Homer. So this was the highest possible praise, and so you can see where some of his thinking comes from. And the other thing was referred to earlier is, you know, I was uh, giving greetings from the Alamo. Um, the, uh, it's not widely known that, again, Scottish Americans uh, were the main factor of the Alamo. It was over 80% of those who died defending the Alamo were of Scottish descent. And that wasn't just an accident of birth. Um, they were inspired by the Scottish Wars of Independence in the 14th century and specifically by the Battle of Bannockburn. And the experience of Bannockburn, if you remember, was of a larger, much larger foreign army coming across their southern border, led by a tyrant who didn't recognize their right to exist as an independent country. That's exactly the experience uh, of Bannockburn. It's the experience of the Alamo. Arguably, it's the experience of the Ukrainians today. The, the uh, passion was mediated and interpreted to them through the poem of Robert Burns called Scots Were Hay, and uh, they quote from it uh, on various occasions. Uh, they had a piper at the Alamo and McGregor. They had a um, they they had a fiddler. Some say it was Crockett, um, and they sang Scots Were Hay from the battlements of the of the Alamo. And so one of the things that we say when we gather there, and we've been doing it for 60 years, um, at, the, at least at the Alamo, not I personally, but, but I've been there for the last 25 years or so. But um, if one of the great sayings in the Scottish military has been, in the American military, has been, remember the Alamo, what would the Alamo defenders themselves have said? It would have been, remember Bannockburn and remember our growth, basically. So there is a strong connection, and I think you could arguably say that without um, Bannockburn and our broke, there would have been no Alamo. Without the Alamo and the Texas Wars of Independence, the United States would never have been a superpower. If they'd never gained Texas and the other Western states that went with it, the United States would have been a minor power on the East Coast of the United States, of, of the American continent. So without the Scots and the inspiration of the Scottish Wars of Independence, uh, I think the United States would never have become a major power the way it is today. So, um, contribution of Scottish Americans has been, and, and Scots and Scottish Americans, has been absolutely enormous. To go back to this issue of authenticity and enthusiasm, which John thought I'd forgotten about, um, uh, it, it really is something that we're just beginning to try to explore and we're trying to be as sensitive as we can. The goal is to try to make sure that we're all on the same page at the end of the day. I think what's disconcerting is when you see 
any element of what is a global community. And um, there are Scots everywhere today. And there are members of, of the McLaren or McGregor clans everywhere today. Uh, what, what is disconcerting is when one group will run off and embrace different traditions, which they may have made up for themselves, uh, which are not consistent with the original traditions or the authentic traditions as much as we can tell them. And the word authentic is sometimes open to dispute. Historians don't like it. I understand, says my, one of my daughters. But um, I, I think there's still some value in trying to um, trying to identify and, if possible, discourage outright fakery. I mean, we're all here because we have uh, a, a passion for our Scottish heritage. And um, that's the real heritage that we have a passion for. And it's not really helped by the folks who wander in thinking that they're in Game of Thrones and they want to have, uh, you know, do, do things that just don't have any historical basis or are not consistent with actual practice, maybe in Scotland. So it's a, it's a delicate issue. We understand how um, independent-minded Scots and Scottish organizations can be, and that's a good thing. But also, uh, there is uh, not just a divide between Scottish concern for dry concern for uh, authenticity and American enthusiasm. The greatest enthusiasm for the authentic heritage that I have ever seen is in America. There are more people who care passionately in this country about their authentic Scottish heritage than you would find in Scotland. Um, so, I think we ought to be able to keep things more or less along the same lines. John, do I do you want me to get into specifics, or should we no. just be polite and leave it at that point? Yeah. 